اعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين respected viewers سلام عليكم ورحمة الله وأعظم الله أجورنا وأجوركم may Allah سبحانه وتعالى reward us and increase our grief over the martyrdom of Sayyidat Nisa'i Al-Alameen, Sayyidah Fatima Al-Zahra. Having said this, I would like to welcome you to yet another edition of the Thursday Night Talk. Tonight, I am honored and I am very privileged to be having two esteemed guests on our panel to discuss with us the topic for tonight, Does the Commemoration of Fatimiyah Contribute Towards Sectarianism? Joining me on the panel for tonight's show, on my right-hand side, we have Dr. Zuhair Olyebek, who is a well-renowned researcher within various fields of Islamic history and literature, and an outstanding translator of a number of texts. Salaamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, doctor. It's an honor to have you on tonight's show. On my left-hand side, we have Brother Hassan Al-Qadiri, who is a student of Islamic sciences, a researcher within his own capacity, and uh, a director of the channel on YouTube, YouTube channel that works hard in Tabligh and propagating the message of Ahlul Bayt using social media, the purified truth. Brother Hassan, salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. It's an honor to have both of you gentlemen on the panel today. Going right into our discussion in regards to the commemoration of Fatimiya and the impact that it has on sectarianism, as is claimed, um, you know, to a great extent within our centers, within the general media. Before we delve into this conversation over here, you know, citing historic, uh, historical evidences, um, it is understood that the daughter of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad this daughter Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra is buried in the night buried in secrecy and until today for the number of billions of Muslims millions of Muslims billions over time from the time of the martyrdom of Rasulullah the burial of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra no single Muslim has been able to establish where exactly Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra salam is buried. We have within traditions and perhaps within literature places where she might be buried, but no one knows for sure. Now, how is it that this daughter of the Holy Prophet of Islam, the one in which traditions are unanimous, where the Holy Prophet said that my daughter Fatima is Sayyidat Nisa al-Alameen, She's the master of all the women. She's the master of the women of Jannah. How is it that this daughter of the Holy Prophet, who is such a central figure in Islamic history, um, the whereabouts of her grave are not even known? Surely there has to be a number of incidents or there has to be reasons uh, behind this reality in the fact that her grave is majhul or not known. Grave site is majhul or not known. Um, beginning with... On my right hand side, Dr. Zuhair, input in this regards, what is the explanation behind the grave of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam not being known? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin, wa al-anatullah ala adaihim ajma'in abad al-abadin. Of course, before the issue of the unknown location of the burial of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra salamullah alayha, uh, the issue of why the attack took place uh, on on her on her house, and which led to her martyrdom in the first place, this she, she needs to be addressed. Um, um, and after that, we will probably easily conclude as to why uh, she has requested that her burial place be uh, hidden <coughs> from. Uh, uh, the people uh, at, that, at that time and for all time, uh, until now and until even on the day, on the, on the Zuhur of Imam Mahdi Ali Hajjallah Ta'ala Farajah Sharif. Um, <clears throat> um, she made that last request because she was, uh, uh, she did not want uh, those uh, who attacked her and 
assaulted her and uh, killed her unborn child and um, the, the, the vicious uh, uh, nature of the assault that took place against her. Uh, she didn't want those uh, to come and pray on her uh, or pray by the, by the side of her grave. So she, uh, that was a, at least a protest uh, uh, against them until the Day of Judgment, uh, against the people who um, assaulted her and treated her the way that they, they treated her. Of course, assaulted her and eventually killed her. Of course. Uh, and of course, killed her child, uh, Sayyid Mohsin. Uh, uh, for, you know, um, based on this, it would be safe to conclude that, number one, it was the will of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra that her gravesite would not be known. Yeah. And this, this will is the form of a protest for, in order for people to go and to discover. Now, there's a number of things over here, Doctor, that you have pointed out that could historically be extremely difficult to digest um, for all Muslims, be them Shia or non-Shia. I mean, we have over here the claim of an attack on Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra. We have the fact that she was killed as a result of the assaults and the injuries that she sustained. And then you have the fact that over here, her unborn child was also killed in the assault, which means that at the moment, what we are presenting to the people is that the grandson of the Holy Prophet, the unborn grandson of the Holy Prophet, was killed by so-called Muslims. Now you can imagine that facts like these, or statements like these, I should say, are extremely difficult for the Muslim Ummah, wider Muslim Ummah to digest. Having said this, Brother Hassan, what are the first steps that need to be taken? in order to be able to establish this, because these are realities that are not easily acceptable by people. And, you know, when you were to go to the layman, the first natural response, well, I'd say natural in terms of its linguistic sense, not natural in terms of your uh, logically speaking, but the natural response would be to decline that this even ever happened. How do we go about in regards to uh, uh, proving that you know these attacks happened do we have historical references that speak texts that speak about the detail in this regards bismillah rahman rahim <clears throat> i think before um get into the, the questions that you're asking Sheikhna, is that we have to the muslims need to understand that someone like sayyid zahra salam, for us not to know where her grave was where the grave is, is it should open up questions. And now I don't want to say that it was because of a will, because first we need to establish the actual events that occurred, you know, the assault on the Zahra alayhi salam. And I think before that we need to go to point one or point zero, let's say, which is to establish a standard, a methodology of how to understand the history and how do we accept historical reports. Sure. Um, as you, many of you would know, inshallah, is that there is a standard when it comes to aqidah. There is a standard when it comes to ahkam, so halal and haram. There is also a standard when it comes to history. Of course. Many, each, each field, sorry, has its own respective exactly. benchmarks. Yes. Okay. So many of the, you know, you see many people come out forward these days and they would say, bring me a Sahih Sanad to prove the event of the door. We tell them, hold on, before we get to that, it's a historical event that occurred. Do we need to have a Sahih Sanad to even prove it? That's, I think that's the question that needs to be answered, that if you give me the opportunity, inshallah, I will try to do it. Of course, in, uh, you know, in a manner of summarization, yeah. by all means, please go ahead. So, as a Shia, for example, if you refer to Mu'jam Rijal al-Hadith by Sayyid al-Khui, volume 14, page 100, when he discusses Amr bin Hamq al-Khuza'i, he says, what was given to us, and this, this is the research that I um, took from Sheikh Ahmed Salman and Sheikh Yahya Simo. So, he says, the Sayyid, Sayyid al-Khui, 
what was given to us from his narrations, even if all were to have weak chain, are still considerable. The greatness of Amr bin Ham is so clear that, it's, that it should not leave any doubt. Furthermore, the testimony of Al-Barqi, so Rajal Al-Barqi, that Amr was among Sharatat Al-Khamis, so the special forces of Amir Al-Mu'mineen, is by its own right sufficient to highlight his great status. I'm just going to quote one more Shia scholar, then a sure. two more Sunni scholars, if that's okay with sure. you. Because I think it's important that we establish the methodology and the standard. Sheikh Kashif al Ghita, in his book, Jannatul Ma'wa, he says, page, page 222, he says, yes, the report that Zayd bin Arqam and Ibn Waqidah, both of which have been transmitted in some reliable books. And what is meant here by reliable is historical reliability, not reliability around which the one derives the Islamic law is based upon, such as the division of reports into Sahih, Hasan, Muwathaq. Rather, it is of those types of reliability, like when we say Tariq al-Tabari, Tariq ibn Athir, are reliable. So you have to differentiate between when you derive ahkam from um, the ahadith and from looking at historical reports. Sure. Then he continues, it is sufficient for someone like the author of Bihar or Turayhi in his al um, muntakhib to transmit a report and for his definition of reliability to establish, let alone for, to, for it to be transmitted by Sayyid ibn Tawus or Shaykh al-Mufid in his al-Irshad and so on. So he differentiates. Sure. So just over here to summarize real quick and even from a layman's perspective, yes. if I was to say or come across a historical narration that is found, for example, in Bihar al-Anwar, the fact that, just on the fact that a scholar as credible as Alam al-Majlisi, Rahmatullah alayhi, has mentioned it in his book. This should be sufficient as a hujjah for me to rely no, on? No, because Bihar al-Anwar is a secondary source. Sure. So depending on where, uh, where al Alam al-Majlisi got his, the source from, right. let's say Kitab al-Irshad or even al-Tabari or so on, that, that would be the discussion there. It's because Bihar al-Anwar is a secondary source. Sure. So we can't uh, base it as a hujjah. Because he course. gathered as much as he can to put it in, in a Understood, behalf. understood. If I just intervene over here for one second, no. put you on pause. Um, Dr. Zuhair, in regards to you know, yourself as a researcher, and uh, many times you know, when it comes to analyzing and authenticating historical narrations, um, people who might come up to you, or many times you come across arguments and debates being within the field of research, uh, how do you deal and what would you say is you know a simple answer when people you know when it comes to the sanad for example the role and the importance of a sanad in his when it comes to historical narrations what level of importance is it supposed to play how are people supposed to understand this um, the the importance of of the sanad is basically when um, the the evidence surrounding the event can also need, also need to be taken into account. Um, when uh, there, are, there is one event and there are various sources uh, from, uh, if you like, different chains of narration or from, from different angles, they, they address this, they point or they cite the event that took place. Apart from the academic uh, uh, approach, right. which Brother Hassan just mentioned, um, as a layman, when you talk to individuals, you say that, this issue has been addressed, this issue has been cited uh, by various scholars and therefore that gives it the authenticity, if you like, in, in short, short term, uh, and the credibility of the events that took place historically. Sure. Ahsan Tup, thank you. Back to you, Hassan, as you were going on. So, also you can find Yahya bin Ma'in, who is one of the scholars of Rajal for the Sunnis. He says, Yahya ibn Ma'in from yeah. the Mukhalifin. Yeah, yeah, from the okay. Mukhalifin. So in his Tariq, Tariq ibn Ma'in, page 113, he says, so he says, I asked him, so ibn Ma'in, right. about al-Bakai, meaning Ziyad, and he said, 
there is no problem with him in Maghazi. But otherwise, no. Ajeeb. So he differentiates between someone that is narrating the seerah, the Maghazi of the Prophet and halal and haram. Of course. Even further, someone like Ibn Hajar al Asqalani, who is known to be Amir al Mu'mineen in hadith for the Sunnis. It's mentioned in his Taqreeb al-Tahdeeb, volume 1, page 407. He says, Saif bin Umar al-Tamimi. For those who have looked into the issue of Abdullah bin Sabah, you would know that he is mainly the main narrator when it comes to Abdullah bin Sabah, especially when it came to the time of Uthman bin Affan. He says, Saif bin Umar al-Tamimi, the author of al-Ridda. He had a book called al-Ridda. Sure. He was called al-Dhab'i. And other names, Kufi, weak in hadith, a pillar in history. I'm going to repeat it again. And other names, Kufi. So some would call him Sayyid bin Umar al Tamim al Kufi. Right. Weak in hadith, a pillar in history. Ajeeb. So, on one hand, when it comes to authenticating the credibility of a person, he may be weak in terms of conveying ahkam of halal and haram. Exactly. But when it comes to historical narrations and citations of historical narrations, yes. the same person can be deemed as reliable. Exactly. Even someone like a dhahbi when he discusses Ibn Ishaq, I'm sure everyone knows Ibn Ishaq who had the seerah. Sure. And he, Dhabi by Dhabi, you mean the author of the tariq? Yeah. Dhabi? Uh, uh, Dhabi, the one that authored Sira Alam and Nubala, okay. uh, student of Ibn Taymiyyah. Sure. The position which persisted in that Ibn Ishaq is a source of emulation in the Maghazi, so a source of rujoo, where you do, he's a marja in terms of Maghazi, Maghazi literature, and the dates related to the Prophet, even though at times he has mentioned rare things, he is not binding authority in what is permissible and prohibited. So they're saying you do rujoo to him when it comes to history, when it comes to maghazi. Sure. But when it comes to halal and haram, you don't go back to him. Of course. So this shows us a standard. And I'll, I have more sources, but I don't want to take up the time. No, 100%. I think al-fikra wasil in the sense that, um, it, uh, you know, from, from everything that you have showed over here, that when it comes to analyzing and when it comes to authenticating Hadith in regards to ahkam fiqhiya, the mi'yar or the scale is separate when it comes to that of history. In fact, I remember um, uh, even uh, uh, the ulama within, uh, within the uh, Hawza ilmiya, you know, when it would come to analyzing tarikh, they would say, and I know Sayyid al-Marja also propagated this a number of times when it came to analyzing and establishing, for example, Farhat al-Zahra, where um, he made the comment and he said that, you know what, when it comes to historical analyzing and authenticating historical events, the Sanad in itself does not play a great role. However, what happens is when it comes to authenticating history, we have different Kara'in. We have indications of circumstances that would allow you, for example, to authenticate this or authenticate that. Just to end on this before we move to the next point, just for the pure purpose of time, is that as a form of a conclusion that if we were to depend solely and purely on a sanad to establish the authenticity of historical events occurring or not occurring, then by virtue of this, perhaps a majority of our Sira Nabawiyya would be destroyed. It would not even be taken into any sort of consideration. If I was to go just based on the Rijal, for example, you have a hadith in regards to the miracles of the Holy Prophet that have also been narrated by Abu Jahal. So the, if I was to go on this mentality of just the Sana, then even the uh, miracles of the Prophet can be discounted in that sense. There's, a, there's actually, um, you've mentioned that, Sheikhna, there's a Salafi historian called Dr. Dhiya Al Amri. Right. He mentions in his book, Dirasat al Tariqiya, that you put in the same standard as you do with hadith when it comes to history is abuse of course he uses that ibarah abuse to the extent that he says that men, there will be so many gaps between them and so much of the seerah of Nabawi will be missing that it, it can't it's be it's an seen. academic disaster regardless of exactly. which, uh, which uh, sect you belong to and sometimes yes 
Sorry, you finish. No, no, I was just going to say it's an academic disaster when these two scales are but not separated. Uh, apart from that, separated, yes. uh, uh, from this issue of um, indication, Qur'an, and the Sahih had uh, uh, the Senate of, of, uh, of an event, in the case of the assault which took place on, uh, on the house of Fatima Zahra, um, there are very strong uh, evidence, evidence or points of evidence is that uh, 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 prove this without any, any doubt. Uh, one of the scholars, for example, I've got books in here for him. Um, he's uh, um, compiled the citation which uh, Sunni scholars make to this event. And right. he, he cites 84 scholars, um, Sunni scholars, uh, who cite uh, this event and who address this event, or who do say that this took place. Right. Um, uh, some of them are highly prominent scholars of the, uh, of the uh, uh, s s among the Sunni scholars. So it isn't just uh, the Qara'in. In this case, uh, there are very strong evidences uh, uh, which prove uh, beyond any doubt, beyond doubt. that uh, this event took place. And of course, here we have at least uh, the, the scholar in question who has uh, uh, compiled this work, uh, at least 84 prominent scholars of the Sunnis. The multiplicity, the uh, multiplicity, exactly, the and multiplicity over time. of authors mm, over time mm, mm. narrating this single yeah. event, Doctor. Yeah. Would and you then say this not is only the that, there are, there are scholars, if you like, Sunni scholars who are um, uh, highly uh, um, uh, huge opponents of the Shia right. um, sect. Yet, these people, like Ibn Taymiyyah, for example, they admit to the fact that uh, they assaulted and attacked the house of Fatima al Zahra and they smashed the door and went in and, and did whatever they did. So it goes beyond that that not just the Qara'in issue, the Senad issue, right. uh, it goes, it's without that that this actually took place and the evidence of this is at least this work. Um, Al-Hujum Ala Bayt Fatima al Zahra. Sure. If um, you could just say the title one more time for our viewers and the author as well. So this is a text that you are able to refer back an to. It's an analytical work. Uh, right. It's called Al-Hujum Ala uh, Bayt Fatima al Zahra. Attack uh, on the house of Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra. Yeah. And uh, in here, between uh, pages uh, 154 and 217, uh, yes, from pages 154, to 217, he addresses. Uh, 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 Who's the author? The uh, oh, all, this, all the scholars, Sunni scholars, sorry, Sunni scholars who, who um, cite this event, who address this event, who actually say that actually it, it, it took place. Um, so it, it's beyond the issue of Qara'in and so on. Of course, an established historical event that yeah. has been narrated. And, and, and as I said, one of the Dahabi and so on and so forth. And one of them is. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah in Minhaj al-Sunnah, he, uh, uh, he cites this event and... Uh, uh, yeah, he's, uh, in Minhaj al-Sunnah what he says is, he doesn't say it's for that reason. Ibn Taymiyyah says that it was to find if there was... Um, yes, he's tried to justify it, to say that, to see if, there are, if they have amassed uh, any wealth of the Muslims in the house of Fatima and Ali. Right. So he, he, so he so tries... The thieves were out Yeah. Them. No, I yeah. mean, see, with Ibn Taymiyyah, and what it comes to my understanding over here is that, and this is a fantastic point that, uh, you know, both of you have brought out over here, the fact that Ibn Taymiyyah mentions this. Exactly. The justification for the occurrence, Ibn Taymiyyah's justification for the occurrence is one thing. Mm. We can debate that, you know, all night long. The fact is over here, outside of the justification, the, the, the fact that Ibn Taymiyyah admits. has come and admitted. Do you have the reference for Ibn Taymiyyah in the book that you're holding, Doctor? Um, it's... Um, um, and in the meantime, Brother Hassan, I know that you have a very methodological approach towards this, but if we were to, if we were to come to a quick conclusion in the sense that the scales of measuring history, authenticating history, as opposed to hadith with halal and haram is different, um, when it comes to the attack of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, a historical source that you, you would have access to that shows us the extent of the assault or the type of assault that happened so, on Sayyidah Zahra? Um, 
Are you saying um, a source to prove the event? Sure. So what we have is, is because many times it could be the exaggerate. Oh, these people are exaggerating from the manabir, for example. Oh no, no, you have. Um, it's so <laughs> widespread the uh, the report. One example. For example, you have in Kamil Ziyarat, you have in the books of Sheikh al Sadduq spread Kamil all over. Ziyarat by Ibn Kaulawai. Kaulawai, the books of Sheikh al Sadduq. You have in the books of Sheikh al-Mufid. Right. You have in the books of uh, Khabar al-Imami. Sheikh al-Mufid, just on this point, there was uh, a debate that we were once having, before I just come back to your reference, uh, doctor. There was a debate that was once going on that Sheikh Mufid actually, mm. in Kitab al-Irshad, the way he mentions uh, Sayyid Mohsin, uh, as being one of the children of Amir al-Mu'mineen, there is a type of an ibarah that is Sahih. put there and that some of the Shia, or it is known amongst the Shia that, you know, Fatima al-Zahra had an uh, unborn child, Mohsin. And the way in which Sheikh Mufid writes it, that there were some people who were from within the Shia school of thought who actually came forward and said, you know what, it's not really established whether Sheikh Mufid believes whether, you know, Sayyid Mohsin existed or not. But when you refer back to other writings of Sheikh Mufid, if my memory serves me right, Kitab al for example, you will find that Sheikh Mufid actually talks about the tragedy in depth. But then, that's what, you know what they say the about that, Sheikh Nam? They say Kitab al and they're, they're right. There's a discussion if it is the book right. of Sheikh Al Mufid. Ajib. So, intisab al kitab ila Sheikh Mufid. This is another discussion that we can perhaps jump into. Just while I put you on hold, we need to go on break. But, Doctor, I need to come back to your uh, uh, reference that you may have pulled out. Uh, Minhaj al Sunnah, volume 4, page 220. Minhaj al Sunnah. Volume 4, right. page 220. And this is by Ibn Taymiyyah. By Ibn Taymiyyah. And the extent of the assault is mentioned in detail. It doesn't mention in detail, no. It right. just it, it, it admits that, uh, yes, it's true that they assaulted, they attacked, and Kebas al Bayt violently attacked the house. Right. But in order to see if they have a mass money, Fatima and Ali have a mass money, which is Bayt al Mal. Yeah. Subhanallah, and the entire universe belongs yeah. to Ali and yeah. Fatima, yeah. and what need is there for yeah. them to have treasures hidden and stacked inside their house? Brothers and sisters, um, we are going to close for a short break over here. Indeed, a very fantastic, interesting conversation. And inshallah, we shall join you back after the break. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome back to Thursday Night Talk. I've been joined with two esteemed guests, Dr. Zuhair Olyabak and uh, Brother Hassan Al Qadiri. Our discussion for tonight, building up to Fatimiya and sectarianism. We've had a fabulous first half where we've had a number of discussions. Number one, in regards to the differences in scales when it comes to authenticating historical narrations as opposed to uh, validating hadith that have to do with halal and haram. Number two, the assault on the house of Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra as an undisputed event that has also been cited within books of the non Shia. One prominent book that has been pointed out, Minhaj al Sunnah, Volume 4 by Ibn Taymiyyah. And as mentioned by Brother Hassan, the event on the assault of Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra that has been mentioned pretty much by every major scholar within the school of thought of Tashayu, from Sheikh Mufid to Sheikh Tusi, and you pointed out Ibn Kaulawai, even in Kamilu Ziyarat. And uh, Alhamdulillah wa shukar. On moving on from here, before we further this discussion, there was a question that was uh, pending from the crowds. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam Your name and question, brother. Sayyid Ali and Nawab. Uh, first of all, I would like to um, uh, thank you for uh, organizing this topic tonight. Jazakumullah. And inshallah, it will be uh, most definitely beneficial to us. And, uh, Alhamdulillah, all praise to Allah Azza wa Jal and a big thanks to um, Imam Hussein Media Group as a media outlet for allowing and facilitating for a conversation of, like, of this nature to be on air. Alhamdulillah, Asantum. thank you very thank much. You. Uh, my question to, uh, to both of your guests. Um, Unfortunately, in uh, some uh, groups who affiliate themselves to, to Tashayu and to um, the path of Ahlul Bayt, they are of the opinion as a result of 
the scholar or the so-called scholar they follow um, and they accommodated themselves within the uh, midst of the ulama of, of Shia uh, of the opinion that the actual um, attack on the house of Amir al muminin and Fatima al-Zahra alayhi yes. did not even occur, did not happen which means that uh, the, the, the so-called the first and the second um, oppressors did not uh, order their companions and did not come to the house of Fatima and that discussion did not happen and the attack and the fire did not uh, occur and uh, Fatima to Zahra was uh, her uh, she did not miscarry her ribs were not broken she was not attacked in that brutal and um, uh, very dramatic uh, way right. and, and the Amir al-Mu'minin as a consequence was not dragged to the, to ma to the masjid uh, uh, asking him to pay allegiance uh, to the first oppressor so um, from the point of view of the, the Shia school of thought and the uh, uh, hadith of Ahlul Bayt salam, how can we come to uh, refute this kind of opinion uh, that this actual attack did not take place on the house of Fatima and Amir al-Mu'minin salam. Of course, a, valley, a very valid question, I must say. And in addition to this, a question that has probably caused a lot of division from yeah. amongst, or a lot of division within the Shia when it comes to commemorating Fatimiya. Uh, starting with yourself, Brother mm -hmm. Hassan, how would we direct such a challenge towards the Shia? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, one of the most important aspects of such discussion is to be as academic as we can and without um, inclining towards any scholar to you know just just not accept something just because they said it sure a scholar can be can can do a mistake he can come to a wrong conclusions at times they're not infallible uh, but what we have is is here i have mirat al Volume 5. Mir'at al-Uqul al-Alam al-Majlisi. It's a comment on al-Kafi. Al al Page 318. He says, so he's discussing the hadith by so Imam al kafi Volume 5. Volume 5, okay. Page 318. He says in 315, they're discussing the hadith of Imam al kafi that's narrated by from his brother, from Imam al kafi where he says, Inna Fatima. Salam, Siddiqatun Shaheed. She's the truthful martyr. Then he goes on to say, Al Hadith al Thani Sahih. That it's Sahih. But then there is a ibarah that he uses three pages after. So 300, we're back to 318 now. Thumma al Khabar, Yadullu ala anna Fatima, Salawatullahi ala kanat Shaheed, Wahua minal Mutawatirat. This is from the footnotes of no. Alam al yeah, his, his commentary of the hadith. His commentary of the hadith. Because in Mir'at al Ukul, uh, Alam al Majlisi alayh, comments on the Sanad as well. Yes, he says within Al Kafi. So he establishes that it is Sahih. No. And then number two, he goes on to say not only is it Sahih, but it is from the Mutawatirat. No. And Shaykh al Tusi, right. who is from our classical scholars from the 5th century, he says, it's the ahadith is mustafidah. There is ijma on it. No one rejects it. Sure. But there is, for me, after discussing it through time and time, just one more reference. Of course, of course. Me, is that before we get into the sources, I don't want, because you know, with sources, sahih, what is the masdar, how did it come, what is the narrations? I want to bring a non-Shia scholar discussing the Shia sect Right. From the time of Imam al kafi Now this is one of the first times in English that I've seen someone mention it. Right. He says, his name is Dhirar bin Amr al-Mu'tazili. Wakana min al ruwat So he used to be a narrator of hadith. Sure. He was, he died around the time, some say 190, some say around that number. So in the time of Harun al-Rashid, in the time of Abil Hassan al kafi Listen to what he says. So he starts talking about the Shia and the Rafada. And he says, And that Abu Bakr and Umar oppressed and hit Fatima, daughter of the Messenger of Allah, until she miscarried an infant. He says, this is the belief of the Shia. Right. He's telling you, someone that's living in the time of Imam al-Kadhim, that the Shia used to believe this. 
There's even another. Uh, just let me just before. let me just add a quick note over here. No. So when you're looking again, the timelines are extremely important, which means that for a period of 180 years, for about 180 years, no. it has been right that the predominant belief amongst the Shia no. is that say the Fatima al Zahra was martyred as a result of the assault, no. and this belief was so widespread. That even the Mukhalifin understood this. Mm. And let me mention over here to you, Doctor, um, I don't know if you would accept this or not, but you know, Imam al Qadim, this hadith emanating from Imam al Qadim. No, no, no. No, no uh, returning. In the time of Imam Qadim, he's just in, stating of course. what is the Shia Rafidi view opinion at that time. At that time. Ahsantum. Coming back to the original hadith, Inna Hamatat or Inna Has Siddiqa Siddiqa Shahida. Siddiqa Shahida. This is a statement emanating from Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al Qadim, Ruhi Lahul Fida, at the time of perhaps Harun La Rashid. Uh, uh, Harun La Rashid. No, we say La Rashid. La there was Rashid. nothing La. Rashid about him. There was no Sahih. Rushd in his character to begin with. During his time, at a time where Tashayyu was at its most difficult times, mm. Imam al Qadim, it would not be, it would not be far fetched when you have Ta'amul in the hadith that this is a person who has spent majority of his time in imprisonment. And he's saying this. And he's still saying this that my grandmother said the Fatima al Zahra was oppressed. Can I just add a, a very important point, Sheikh Nan? You see, when it comes to someone like Hisham bin al Hakam, you see that the Mukhalifin of his time, even in his time and after, they would say that he believed in Tajseem. Right. And when, they used to, when the companions used to come and ask the Imams, what did the Imams do? Say, no, we don't believe such things. They stand up and reject it. Of course. When it comes to a matter like this, we even have another source from the time of Imam al Jawad and Imam al Rubha, where it's mentioned that the Rafula used to believe in it. Right. From a Mu'tazili scholar. And they used to um, believe that Omar kicked uh, Zahra alayhi salam, killed an infant and so on. You would see that the Imams never stood up and said, no, we didn't believe. This is a very crucial matter. Of and course. that's why I'm trying to go through a method where we don't need to get into even Asanid. It's clear cut. Their ulama, our ulama are in agreement that the Shia, the Rafida believed that Umar bin al-Khattab attacked a Zahra alayhi salam, assaulted her, and they came to the house and they burnt the door. They and agree the on attack, that. And the attack is not only, the, the narrations of the attack is not only um, exclusive to Shia texts, but as mentioned, even within the text of the Mukhalifi. Let me just put you on pause over here. Doctor, no. a, a, a belief that is so predominant over history, you know, how is it that despite all this proof, I mean, you come in and you still have, you know, people who claim to be followers of Ahlul Bayt still negate this. And perhaps when Fatimiyah comes in, you find even many, many times, I'm not trying to be controversial, but I'll get straight to the point, where you'll find even when it comes to many centers, Hosseiniyahs, Imam Bargas of our own, when it comes to Fatimiyah, you know what, you're going to have the legion, the telephone, the khatib. Have a word with the khatib that, listen, you know, we really don't want you to speak about this. Let us speak. And you will find Fatimiya topics about everything and anything except Sayyidina Fatima al-Zahra, or the oppression of Sayyidina Fatima al-Zahra. I mean, something that is so, you know, well-established in history. It's a no-brainer. Doctor, what's your opinion? How is it or why is it that people would, you know, reject this and perhaps even discourage commemoration of Fatimiya? in the true spirit of Fatimiyah within the Husseiniyahs. Well, you put it very well, alhamdulillah. It's uh, politics. Allah. They, they're trying to be politically correct. Um, <laughs> you said this they, with so much ease, politics. Uh, yeah, Allah. unfortunately. Uh, unfortunately, the, the body of evidence of the assault on the house of Fatima al-Zahra and the killing of Fatima al-Zahra and the killing of Sayyid, Sayyidina Muhsin, sallallahu alayhi wa who was named by the Prophet sallallahu right. while he was in the, in the womb of his mother uh, at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa um, The body of evidence is so vast and has uh, reached various domains, uh, but yet when, when we have people who uh, say this didn't happen, basically it's for political reasons. Surely, uh, Doctor, what is there to gain politically? 
they've got some political interests and therefore they sweep everything under the carpet and they tell their followers, oh, that didn't happen, uh, in order to further and pursue whatever interest they had in mind, unfortunately. You know, if it is for the case of the dunya, you know, this is, this is something very big to trade off in regards to the dunya. And, you know, when it comes to concealing, if you have a look that a historical event like this is so clear, when it comes to concealing the event of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, let me just pull out for you a verse of the Quran in itself. And this is something for all of us. And I say this to myself before saying this to anybody else, um, to ponder about this. Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 42. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَلَا تَلْبِسُوا الْحَقَّ بِالْبَاطِلِ وَتَكْتُمُوا الْحَقِّ وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ do not, do not disguise falsehood with truth. Do not mix truth with falsehood. Disguise it. وَتَكْتُمُوا الْحَقِّ And conceal the truth. While you know. وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ While you know that it is true. And you have a second verse of the Quran. And you know, when you say politics, this just, this just brought this up over here. Number Surat Ali Imran, verse number 71. Ya ayyuha al-kitab, ya, ya ahl al-kitab, lima talbisuna al-haqq bil-batil wa taktumuna al-haqq wa antum ta'lamun. The khitab over there is towards the Ahl al-Kitab, but the Ishara is towards us even today. Mm -hmm. Oh people, why, right. is it, why is it that you try and mix falsehood with truth, disguise truth as falsehood or vice versa? But this is the point. And you conceal the truth when it comes to matters of haqq. Yeah. And I believe that the Qadiyah of Sayyidina Fatima al-Zahra is... Absolutely applicable when it comes yes. to this verse of the Quran because she's the me'yar between haq and batil. Um, in this, you know, having said this, political gains and so on and so forth, you know, let me just cut straight to the chase over here. And I'd like to get both your esteemed opinions on this. Does the commemoration of Fatimiya lead to sectarianism? So, in my humble opinion, I think it's definitely a discussion where our opponents, our Sunni brothers and sisters will definitely, definitely get upset by it. But having said that, just like when they mention the different um, events where, for example, they would say Abu Talib was a kafir or right. the mother of the Prophet is a, is a kafir or the father of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is a kafir. We have to be, they ha we have to be tolerant that this is something found in their books. We disagree, we harshly disagree, right. but this is our opinion. The problem with the way that things are run is that for many years, and I'm talking about those who are specially involved in Sunni Shia polemics. Right. So they are, I'm talking from the Sunni side now, that are involved in Sunni Shia polemics. Okay. They want you to stay quiet. They don't want you to speak. They want you to do things the way they want you to do. But we are Shia, and I always say this. We are Shia, masters of our own. We have, we choose to follow and be servants to 14 infallibles. Of course. And our belief is our belief, and we should be able to express our belief when and how we want to. It but of course, within, within the boundaries of what's accepted, and what's not? What do I mean? As in, for example, no doubt we, we do have the practice of la'na. And, and for certain fuqaha, we do have the practice of sab against the enemies of Ali Muhammad alayhum as right. When it comes to a matter like this, should that be done openly? There's a discussion. That we should be able to show who killed a zahra who attacked a zahra We should be able to say their name. But of course... Understand that there's respect and then there is disrespect. Of course, I mean, you see, it, it boils down to freedom of speech. Of course. Are you able to or should we not have the opportunity or the freedom to academically, non-violently express historical facts that have happened? You know, obviously, whenever you talk about any historical massacre or genocide that has happened, 
even when it comes to world history, non-faith-based history, you are always going to have one side that is not happy with, no. with, with, the, with the analysis of the history over there. But so long as things are done in an academic manner, in a civil manner, you know, there is no reason why an academic discussion should lead to violence. What's your take on this, doctor? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I think if we do the Fatimi uh, uh, with complete transparency, uh, it will cause unity, if anything, rather than... Uh, Ajeeb. Uh, because... Fatimiya causes unity. Causes unity. Even though the culprits of... Yes. Because basically, what we're trying to do is to present the truth. And the truth isn't only in our books, also in, in, in Sunni sources, as uh, was mentioned earlier. And all we need to do is, in a, in, a, in a calm manner, we need to present the truth to our Sunni brethren. And uh, when they see that, uh, in time, that will cause unity uh, in, in, instead of division. Of if we stay put and hush-hush things and don't say anything about it, it is that which causes division. Um, but if we, if we do the Fatimiyya and we present the full truth and we don't compromise on any and hiding any of the truth. Right. Uh, uh, and then, uh, as you mentioned, in a, in a very calm manner, uh, say to the people, to all the people, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, Sunni or Shia, as to what happened, um, that will be the cause for greater unity in the long term. The, the majority, the overwhelming majority of the people are decent people. Right. And when they see the heinous crimes committed against Fatima al-Zahra and the way it was perpetrated, uh, nobody will accept that. Even though, even if to begin with, they will, find, they will find it hard to believe, they will find it difficult to digest. But uh, there have been many instances when people were confronted with this. Uh, they paused a little bit, they studied it, they investigated the thing, and they accepted the truth. Of so so. Fatimiyya will cause nothing but unity of amongst course. all Muslims. I think it is an opportunity to present the truth for those free souls and free thinkers that are actually seeking the, th the truth. And a number of people have actually come into the fold of Tashayyu yeah. after yeah. having realized the reality of yeah. the, the attack on the House of Sayyidah. The Zahra. majority of the people, the overwhelming majority of the people are uh, uh, decent and they want to know the truth. Uh, some, the problem is you, you find some who throughout their life they've been thinking about Fulan and Fulan, very, very good, very decent, very this and that. Uh, when you tell them the truth, they will find it hard to begin with. Sure. But the majority of the people are decent, they have free souls, and they will, Allah, inshallah, will guide them. But we, the important thing is that we haven't done enough. I think the, the ball is in our court. We haven't done enough to present the truth to, to, the, to, the, to, to humanity. I to agree with to you. the people, Muslims or non-Muslims, uh, especially to our Sunni brethren, we have not done enough to present the truth. One hundred percent. It's 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 our fault I agree that we with have you. this. One hundred percent, Doctor. And in fact, I will go one step forward. And as is emphasized within the Khutbah Fadaki of Sayyidat Nisa Al Alamin, in that she said that. This stealing the right of Amir al-Mu'mineen and this attack on me is what's going to open the door for every type of dhulm and chaos yes. in the world. Exactly. Asasu asasa dhulm. Mm. This asasu dhulm yes. from yes. Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra. Mm. So the root when it comes to solving global, geopolitical, faith-based wars mm. that are happening, Mm. The solution towards all this is to understand what happened to Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra. Just while I put both of you on hold over here, question from the crowd. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Your name, please? Ali Salahab. Ahlan wa marhaban. My question is, could it be argued that it is due to taqiyya that some Shi'as do not mention or do not commemorate the shahada of Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam? Sure. We will direct the question to both the guests to have an opinion, Brother Hassan. I see so you're I was, that was something I was, I was going to mention, is that um, 
we do have to understand that not every single community is able to openly speak about Fatima. Sure. Um, now again, Taqiyya has a discussion as in, is it, does it fall into the haram? People are deviating because of it. Is it halal? There's a whole discussion, a fiqhi discussion, right? So think there is the rules and regulations that, that govern um, the implementation and the execution of taqiyya. Yeah. So like I said, if, if they have an excuse where they, they have to practice taqiyya, then so be it. Then we, we have an understanding. But to come forward and cause a whole community to start doubting the event of the door, so what they say is, is that they doubt the physical assault. They don't doubt the actual threatening of the door. Right. Now, something that I want to put forward as well, just from my own research and my humble opinion, I do not believe from Sunni sources you are able to prove the event of the door, the physical assault. What you can prove... If you are going to be fair and look at their sources properly and investigate it, even from a historical standpoint, Tahdeed. yeah, was that there was a threat. And for me, anyway, that is good enough for me to know these individuals, who they were and how they acted. See, well, no, uh, can I just come into this? Uh, no, the, you mentioned that, for instance, they believe in the physical assault, but they don't, they, on the assault on the, on the house or on the door, but not on the assault on the individual. This is Ibn Taymiyyah. But the rest, like the Shahristan in Nahal and so on, it says, Rafasaha Rafsatan Askata Janina. Ibn Taymiyyah doesn't, he says. So, Ibn, uh, can, can just, so we have the overwhelming majority of the Sunni scholars do say there was physical result, uh, assault on Fatima to Zahra. Rafasaha Rafsatan Askata Janina. The overwhelming majority of this. Let me just. The, let my, me the minority, you. like Ibn Taymiyyah, say, oh, there was an assault only on the house on the door but nothing physical on the on the occupants let me just read you a quick passage from Milal and Nihal by Shahristani yeah by he talks about Sayyar ma rawahu Shahristani an Ibrahim ibn Sayyar ahsad al-Mu'tazali inna Umar dharabah bin Fatima yawm al-bay'ah hatta alkat al-janin min batniha fa you know having said this I understand as well when you were you know when you line up um, a lot of the masadir from, from the uh, mukhalifin, you come to the extent that they stop at the tahdeed. But then again, as a person whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed you with the faculty of the intellect, the aql, is not far for a person to connect the dots together on no. the assumption Sorry, well, I mean, that we didn't, it's there. Neither you nor uh, we didn't translate the hadith. Uh -huh. um, Sorry. Can you so what Shahristani says on the narration no, of Ibrahim. I've got Ibrahim. the translation, Shaykh. Right, go for that. So Shahristani mentions it in his Mil uh, al-Nahal. He says he, Ibrahim uh, Sayyar, uh, Ibrahim bin Sayyar, has inclined to rough and he disparaged the major companions and he increased in the lie, falsehood, and he, Ibrahim bin Sayyar, that said that Umar hit the stomach of Fatima on the day of Bay'ah. So he was a Mu'tazali right. that died in the, um, the year 221 or some say 229. Right. So that again, it's a Mu'tazali scholar. They don't, they, when you go back to the Tarajum, Al-Ilm al jarh wa Ta'deel, they don't even take from him. There's right. no other, that's, what, that's his opinion. But you know what this shows? This, this, show, this goes back to Sayyid Ali's point. Is that he, this shows, he was in the time, if my memory serves me right, Imam al Jawad and maybe Imam al Kava, uh, Imam al Rada. And he is saying, so the, so the, the Rafidi believe, so his inclination to Raf, like See, a Shahrat Stan is saying. Even if the claimant saying, is there, even the claim is there, even if this person is, lacks any credibility according to their. Uh, but for rules, us, it's good. However, even it's not, it's good for us. It shows that even the weakest, most uncredible person is citing a belief that is predominant, as mm. understood from the previous text when we are looking through Mir'at al Ukul. But I mean, having said this, again, the person who's been blessed with the intellect, it's not hard to connect the dots, even if you stop just at the tahdeed. Even if you stop just at the tahdeed, okay, you have a jama, a group of people who came to the door of Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra, they threatened her. And then the books go blank, but everybody's in agreement that she died at the age of 18. 
and her grave is not known. So, yeah, of course. W- w- you know, when the intellect thinks about this, it's not hard to connect the two dots together. For me, and in fact, it puts the ulama of the Mukhalifin in a very tough situation of course, because there is a missing part of history. And this even aggravates the situation in that why is this history hidden? Exactly. If that understood. Now, we have very little bit of time remaining for the show. However, I want to ask this one question over here. Dr. Zuhair, um, from your research, uh, when it comes to uh, Eid al-Ghadir, and uh, you know, when the bay'ah was given to Amir al-Mu'mineen al-Ghadir, from the research that you have put together, historically, what does the book state in regards to the number of people who gave bay'ah to Amir al-Mu'mineen? Um, the reports that the number who were present at the Ghadir Khum site where uh, the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi had previously told them that they should gather there. Um, <clears throat> he, he, he told them that when he was still in Mecca, right. after Hajj, he said, I don't want anyone uh, to leave Mecca except to arrive at Ghadir Khum. Okay. And there were about uh, 12,000 people who had come from Yemen. And Yemen is to the south of Mecca, Ghadir Khum is to the north of Mecca. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, we want to go south. He said, no, I want you to come Ghadir Khum. Detour even in their route. <laughs> even even there, so in, in, they had to travel in the opposite direction. Sure. Uh, this was in Mecca. Uh, so the number of people who gathered uh, at Ghadir Khum is estimated at least 120,000. Um, and... Uh, well, I don't know how, well, how, much, how much time I've got, how much, where I can go. Um, um, so there were 120,000 people there who attended there. The Prophet Sallallahu made sure that they gather around. It was hot day. They, oh, hot, the season was summer. They gather around somewhere where there is uh, access to abundant uh, fresh water, which was the freshwater lake of Ghadir. Um, Ghadir Khum, and they'd gathered there, and the Prophet Sallallahu delivered the uh, speech. Um, the, the khutbah is about, in today, if you front in small, si- small font, it's about t- 10 pages, A4. So a lengthy psalm, when you could say. Uh, that's why when they, when, in the hadith, on the narrations, when they say khataba Rasulullah, means he gave a sermon. And a sermon is not just a hadith. Of like course. when they say it's it's known that it is man kuntu mawla fa'ada aliyun mawla right but this is only an excerpt f- uh, from it it's just an, a quote from it the of entire course. khutbah uh, uh, would take probably more than an hour to recite right um, it will take us more than an hour to recite um, we need to investigate to see how much how long did it take as, by the prophet to deliver that speech uh, let me just put you on pause over here doctor real quick again just for the benefit of myself and for the viewers if it came to researching the event of ghadir yeah. what texts would you recommend you know literally one two three what texts would you recommend in regards to um, kitab al ghadir by allama amini okay uh, this is number one and uh, I think if you if you start with that, you don't you don't want to go to number two and three. Of course, um, yeah. Alama, I mean, so far it's a, he he published, he had designed uh, so that he could he could it could be this book could be twenty five volumes. He published eleven volumes during his lifetime, and right. unfortunately he passed away. Um, I've heard that uh, three other volumes have been published afterwards, uh, recently. Uh, that makes it 14. Sure. And of course, the rest, the, ele- the remaining 11 uh, <clears throat> are not to stage that, up to stage that they can be published. They can be published. So okay. we have at least 11, if not 14 volumes. Of course. Uh, to go through. And again, the abundance of evidence uh, for Ghadir is so huge that Alama Amini managed to put, compile these together. 100%. The, these 14 vol- 11 volumes or 14 volumes are only citation of Sunni references or references of Sunni scholars throughout time. And um, um, on the issue of the chain of narrations, it, it, as I said, it's, it is so, the evidence for it is so vast sure. that uh, uh, the overwhelming majority of, of scholars, of Sunni scholars who have the decency to accept, to see the truth and narrate it, <coughs> accepted it. Excuse um, me. Uh, there is a narration which uh, 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 is reported by 
Sunni Imam al Haramain Abil Maali al Juwaini, right. um, who passed away in the year 478, so it's about 963 years ago, nearly a thousand years ago. Um, and he said, I was surprised to see in Baghdad that uh, someone who was binding a book binder, who was binding the book, right. uh, I saw a book in his, he, while he was binding it. And it said, وَفِيهِ رِوَايَاتِ خَبَرُ غَدِيرْ خُمْ مَكْتُوبًا عَلَيْهِ الْمُجَلَّدَةِ الثَّامِنَ وَالْعِشْرُونَ مِنْ طُرُقِ قَوْلِهِ صلى الله عليه وآله مَنْ كُنْتُ مَوْلَى فَعَلَى عَلِيُّ مَوْلَى So he saw volumes. volume 28 being bound by a book binder in Baghdad. Um, and it says the chain of narrations, volume 28, chain of narrations of uh, the Prophet's uh, speech Man kuntu mawla fa'ad ali mawla. And it says, wa yatluhu, it's written on it, wa yatluhu al-mujallad al-tasi' wal-ishroon. This report is reported by al-imam Abil Ma'ali al-Juwaini, Imam al-Haramain, who passed away nearly a thousand years ago. You can imagine, extensive work that has been done you know, in regards to Ghadir, 120,000 companions. I know, you know, we literally have a closing five minutes over here. And this question perhaps needs quite a lot of depth when it comes to answering. Mm -hmm. By way of summary, Brother Hassan, you have 120,000 people reported to have given bay'ah to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam in Ghadir. But yet, you know, one thing that people struggle to understand is that where did all these companions go when Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra was being attacked? If you could, you know, by way of summary, be able to give us an answer that would be able to put to bed a lot of these shukuk that are out there. What happened to all the companions? Where was no. they? I think this is one of the most important questions to be asked regarding because I think it's, it is a very important question to summarize the, what really occurred because sure. then we'll start to put the puzzle together. So the answer to, the, to this is, is this. One, Many of the companions lived in different cities. Right. Yemen, other parts of uh, the Arabian Peninsula. As the doctor mentioned, so a big number of them. So had a number of them was not there. Sure. And a number of them were with who? Usama. Aha, uh -huh, the Jaish that in the was Jaish. put together. And there is a letter that is found in Kitab al Ihtijaj. And honestly, when I started reading it, uh, actually, I started crying. Ihtijaj, Kitab al Ihtijaj, by Tabarsi. Right. Where it says that Abu Bakr sent a letter, I'll summarize it very quickly. He sent a letter to Usama. He says, Ya Usama, from the Khalifa of Rasulullah. This, this is, and Usama replies back to him. He says, You said um, Khalifa of Rasulullah. Who made you a Khalifa of Rasulullah? This status, this rank is only for Amir al Mu'mineen. And this is received well, by Osama while he's at the, at the uh, forefront. He, no, they haven't reached yet. They haven't reached But yet. they're not in Medina. No, either. they're not in Medina. They're okay. far away, sure. days away. Because we literally have just about 100 seconds to wrap this up. The first reason, people not being there or, you know, number one, a lot of them were not in Medina. They don't Residents live in, of Medina Yemen, they don't live in Medina. Number two, a big number of the companions were one. out with Osama. Number three? Number three is that many of the companions that were in Medina, you could say were arrested. They was arrested. There was an arrest on them. It says there's narrations that's found in the book of um, As-Saqifa by Lut bin Yahya, which is not with us now, but sure. Al-Mufid narrates from it, where he says they were beaten and more or less arrested. Al to that extent, so that's why you don't see many people coming to Save us Zahra. <clears throat> I know that there is a tradition that is found in Kitab Sulaim bin Qais al Hilali, uh -huh. which uh, states that uh, Salman al Muhammadi alayh, was strangled to the extent that the complexion, if I paraphrase the words that are there, the complexion of his face, the color of his face had changed because of the intensity with which he was being strangled in order for the bay'ah uh, to be given to him. There is much to discuss over here and uh, you know I'm truly humbled to be surrounded by wealth of knowledge by both of you brother Hassan and Dr. Zuhair and the time doesn't do us justice is not enough time for this discussion. One, point, one thing I wanted to say but I don't know whether I sure. have time. Please as a wrapping well, up statement th and there I were will many, conclude. As brother Hassan there were many who ex didn't accept this 
when they heard about it, they refused to give allegiance to, uh, right. to, to the ruler. And what this cause was Hurub al Radda. Hurub al Radda, which people turned back on Islam and apostate and went back to it. It's not true. Basically, they did, they did not accept Abu the Bakr leadership Bakr. of Abu Bakr. They, wanted, they were saying that the Khalifa is Ali ibn Abi Talib. And hence, they started calling the historians or whatever, they started calling these battles Hurub al Radda. Of course, it became the perfect, uh, it became excuse. the perfect excuse, yeah. the perfect alibi, if you could say. I think to do justice to this topic, we need to have a number of seatings together, inshallah. But and for inshallah, tonight, in another topic, we need to address the issue of Bani Aslam, who, who came yes, the, in their, the in their thousands and uh, entered Medina. Of and, course. And, did all and you know what? These are parts of Islamic history that perhaps a lot of our children are people from within the faith, yeah. not children, elders as well, yeah. and uh, perhaps even scholars who are not really aware of these incidences. Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the blessings of Ahlul Bayt, inshallah, bless us with a number of opportunities, inshallah, to sit on platforms like these and have genuine academic heartfelt discussions um, in regards to principal matters of our faith. Having said this, brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah wa shukar, a lot of us, a lot of information for us to take back home and ponder. And I believe that the discussions that have been held today over here serve as a beautiful platform for each and every one of us to conduct research when it comes to understanding the tragedy of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, the manner in which it is narrated within the books of the Mukhalifin, the manner in which it is narrated within the books of the Shia, understanding that the criteria of validating hadith as per history and as opposed to validating hadith for uh, uh, halal and haram, these are two different scales. Understanding and being confident that commemorating Fatimiyah doesn't lead to sectarianism. In fact, if Fatimiyah is to be commemorated in its true spirit, this would promote the true and the real unity within the Muslim Ummah. This and many other things to discuss, inshallah, on future opportunities. But for tonight, on behalf of Imam Hussein Media Group and the Thursday Night Talk Show team, thank you very much for following us on tonight's program. And God willing, inshallah, we look forward to presenting to you a show next week as well. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.